May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. So last week, our topic was presence. And I had to think about whether or not I was going to use my best story ever so early in my time here. But I threw caution to the wind and used it anyway, figuring there's always another great story out there. And as I considered one of the world's most brilliant men pushing his little neighbor girl on the swings, I came to the conclusion that presence and passion are like two sides of the same coin. You don't get one without the other. And so it is fortuitous in our planning that we place them here in the middle of this series, because this is a centerpiece of the Christian life, presence and passion. So as I thought more about this, I thought, you know, this image of two faces on a coin isn't quite right either, because you can't see both at the same time. Rather, passion and presence are more like an orb that is in perfect completeness, one not obscuring the other. And then I had this little itch at the back of my brain. <laughs> what is that? Oh, yes, that's the little hazelnut. That's Julian of Norwich. She writes of God showing her this round little ball the size of a hazelnut in her hand. What may this be? She asks. And God tells her that he has shown her all that is made was brought into being through the love and passion of God. And she said, it, this hazelnut, it lasteth and ever shall because God loves it. And so all things have their being in God. And so I spent some more time meditating on this intensity of presence and passion together. Now, you certain people have that single-minded focus, that intensity of gaze. And their life proves this out that it's overflowing with passion. And if we look carefully and we think about it, that this is their lived testimony of the presence of God's unending love in them. No pressure. <laughs> but remember what I said last week. The vast majority of us are Alberts. Einstein's only happen every once in a while. But that does not signify that God is any less present in our passions. All passions should be celebrated and nurtured. One way that we encourage human passion is through arts education for our children. So I have a funny story that I hope is relatable, maybe more so out here than up here. <laughs> when I was nine, my mother finally gave in to all of the begging for piano lessons. And within a couple weeks, I was crying at every lesson, every single one. Hot cross buns was my utter defeat. <laughs> this is true, so much crying, but I wasn't gonna give up. <laughs> you haven't got me yet, hot cross buns. <laughs> Just you wait, Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> and I just kept crying and struggling. Now, that's not exactly what we think of when we imagine passion. Except for this one day when I got so angry that I passionately colored an entire page of my piano book, jet black, with my pencil. I was on fire. I scribbled and scribbled and cried until the paper shined. It was so beautiful. Then, that fit of passion left me. <laughs> a little too late, I realized that there would be no hiding this masterpiece. <laughs> my mother and my teacher would see the evidence of my rage. But anyway, I wasn't heading off to Interlochens anytime soon. However, I persisted. 
And eventually the things that I understood in my head the whole time were finally coming out of my hands and I learned to love practicing. I practice all the time. I drove my family crazy. <laughs> but within the practice of anything, which requires a great deal of concentration, I think we see there a godly gift waiting to be discovered. This evidence of God's passion and a direct experience of his never-ending love for us. These experiences suited me well as a piano teacher, because kids cry at lessons, it's a thing. <laughs> now, if you aren't sure what you are passionate about, here's some clues. Know that passion is the thing that makes you lose all sense of time. It keeps you up late at night. It makes you talk other people's ears off. <laughs> you can't stop thinking about the thing that you are passionate about. That's love, right? Remember the first time you fell in love? All you could think about and talk about was that special person? Every passion in us has that kind of energy. Most people who engage in any kind of passion experience this inner drive. But they also experience the drive to share their passion. Passion isn't for us alone. It's given to us that we may give it to others. And so no matter how scared they feel when they offer themselves, they do it anyway. Another thing learned through taking piano lessons when you're a child, <laughs> passion is risk. Whether the thing you are sharing with the world is your first poem, a lumpy vase, your awesome free throw, a blurry photograph of your cat, your best cupcakes, your first solo, you are sharing with the world a little corner of your true self. Through your passion, you are becoming present to the world as the blessed child of God you were meant to be. Now think about this. We all want this for our kids, that they develop a sense of passion for something in their lives. But I feel like we give up on it for ourselves somewhere along the way. Like somehow becoming an adult takes all the fun out of taking risks and being vulnerable in front of others. And yet, God is wildly passionate about us. How can we learn to re-engage with God joyfully and passionately? Today we heard the parable of the prodigal son, which is actually a very passionate story, so many feelings. There's the good boy who always colors within the lines and whose anger at the generosity of the father prevents him from receiving his actual inheritance, which is joyful intimacy with the father. Not money, not land, but relationship. The prodigal son, who doubts his worth and expects no joy when he returns, but he comes back. Now this not expecting joy is the thing they share. This underappreciation of the father's joy in them and a certain lack of passion. The one guy thinks he'll find passion in, what was it? One of those fancy, fancy words. Desolate living, forgetting the word. The other thinks maybe he'd find passion in just being good and following all the rules and living like a slave. But both of them end up passionless and hungry. I think that this is where we are sometimes with God, avoiding risks and keeping him at a safe distance assuming that false passions are all that it's about, maybe, or working ourselves to the bone for the treasure that we cannot take with us. Sometimes we're like the brother toiling away in the pig pen, eating pig food, or the other toiling away, probably eating something healthy, getting his vegetables in. I'm not that brother. In terms of distance, he appears closer, 
But in terms of allowing his father into his heart, he might as well be on the moon. And then there's the father looking for the return of his child, just as God looks for us to enter the banquet with joy. Not just someday in the future, but right now. In our lives, we should pay attention for when we become enslaved to work and social status and the way it pushes out the passions of our younger selves. We should consider if these entanglements are no more life-giving for us than the locust pods and the pig pen. And we should become as brave and passionate as children and enter God's banquet with gladness in our hearts, ready to be filled and fed with the joy and passion of our return. <laughs>